<laughs> she probably got up to do something because they said, ah. She, she said, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. no Give worries. Me a second, yeah. Okay, you're live and broadcasting, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen here and Perfect. get our introduction rolling. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's misbehaving there for me. That's okay. I'll get it. Okay. All right, terrific. Uh, we opened the webinar up, a lot of keen people. We've already got over 150 that uh, have logged in. Welcome to our third presentation of the day. This is gonna be Dr. Ian Tester, uh, and he rounds out our Card P day. Card P is the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics. And thank you uh, for Dr. Peter Thompson, the president of the Card P, for putting together uh, these speakers and allowing us to do this and being part of the WAGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. Uh, Card P and uh, AGD have had a pretty good alliance over the years, and uh, it's been uh, great attending the annual meetings. Uh, I guess the first time I attended a Card P meeting was in Halifax, and that had to be oh, 10 plus years ago now. So um, I'm really uh, happy to be a member and happy to share our colleagues uh, back and forth with different dental meetings, whether it be the Operative Academy, the International Academy of Nathology meeting, etc. So We've got a lot of friends uh, that uh, help us out with doing um, hands-on courses here in Washington State at the WAGD Educational Center. We actually have a hands-on facility where we can do courses uh, for dentists, uh, assistants, hygienists, you, you name it. Uh, we also uh, rent it out to other groups and that where uh, we have room for 140 to hear lectures. We have room for doing hands-on. Uh, courses and we actually uh, have five operatories. So we've got a real ro robust um, program at the Washington AGD. And if you're interested, go to www.washingtonagd.org. You'll see these flyers that are going by have QR codes on those. Um, and you can use those to register for uh, tomorrow's uh, CE events and uh, next week with uh, Dr. Marcus Trolsch, who will be speaking on Tuesday uh, with a real nice focus on PPE and aerosol. This is one that you'll want to, to put down to watch. Uh, you may want your staff members to see that as well. I've seen it and it's absolutely fantastic. A lot of people ask uh, if they miss part of a webinar or want to see something again, where do they go? Well, that's uh, YouTube. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. It's Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, if you forget that, just go to WashingtonAGD.org and you'll be able to just click on that YouTube uh, logo there. That'll take you to our channel. Remember to like, subscribe, and ring the bell so that you'll be notified when there's new webinars. For those of you uh, that are in Washington State and have not done your opioid and suicide uh, training yet, we will have a program on Monday for doing both of those. And that's going to be a long day. That'll be three hours uh, on each of those subjects. Uh, we will be trying to get the registration for that finalized uh, here in the next 24 hours or so. So uh, we'll do our best to get it up um, on our web page, but uh, you're probably better off to look at our Facebook page. It'll be on there sooner than on our website. Uh, we just lag a little bit on getting things up on the website, it just uh, the way it is when you're uh, an all volunteer army here. 
Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mark Douglas uh, for this morning's presentation. Wonderful. And then Dr. Kim Parlett did a great job uh, with the tough subject occlusion. Uh, really liked his take on that. And Dr. Tester is going to continue up uh, uh, where um, Dr. Parlett set him up for uh, uh, the topic of centric relations. So very excited to hear what he has to say. And uh, maybe he, well, he's a brave man for tackling that topic. Hey, tomorrow um, is our Implant Study Club. Dr. Yassine continues um, with that series. He's got some guests on tomorrow, and I think that's the fourth one of the Study Club series, and that's very interactive. So if you have questions, um, it's a, a great series to sign up for, um, and I believe he's got one more of those next week on the 13th that he's doing as well. We'd like to thank our University of Washington uh, School of Dentistry student chapter for the uh, AGD chapter uh, for their support in um, suggesting uh, some speakers during this webinar series. We'd like to thank the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. The University of Washington CD department is providing your CE credits. Your CE credits will be emailed to you um, at uh, the email address you registered at. You should see those within two to three days, but let's see, it's Thursday here. Uh, that's two or three working days. So it's not gonna be there Sunday, maybe Monday, Tuesday kind of thing. AGD members, uh, we will be reporting your CE credits directly to the Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, those should show up on your transcripts within two to four weeks. If you're not an AGD member, you might consider being an AGD member. It's been a great organization uh, for me. It's allowed me to meet some fantastic people. Um, and uh, I would encourage all young dentists to take a look at it. If you graduate dental school here in June, um, next year, I think your first year's membership with the Academy of General Dentistry is $78, which is a pretty low bar to entry. Uh, we have our fellowship tracks and our master track programs. And if you want more information on that, uh, WashingtonAGD.org, we actually have a master track program that uh, was the brainchild of Dr. Gary Hayamoto. He set up this master track program to allow um, participants to get CE credits, especially their hands-on credits, uh, over a period of five years. So if you graduated dental school today and uh, got into the master track program, you would be able to finish your master's in that five years if you attended all the CE, uh, hands-on CE uh, in that master track and did your case presentations. So uh, that's been one of the best uh, CE things I've ever done. You know, I've enjoyed the time uh, with uh, the Dr. Koises and the Spears and Pankies and, and Dr. Michael Fling and his series and etc. cetera. But um, the uh, uh, AGD Master Track was uh, very, very rewarding and it's very cost effective. So take a look at that. Um, you'll see some other courses that are coming up. We have our implant um, uh, continuum that uh, Dr. Yassin heads, and that's uh, 12 sessions, I think it is. It's 10 or 12 sessions. I'm sorry, the flyer just went by, and each session is uh, uh, packed full. Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually 10 sessions, and it's 240 hours of implant uh, training, and that's hands-on, and that's here in uh, Seattle at uh, the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, our educational center down at SeaTac. We uh, have been doing these webinars for many weeks now. It's the Washington AGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE Series. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Comet USA, Patterson Dental, Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, Seattle King County Dental Society. 
We'd like to thank our friends from the International Academy of Nathology. Thank you, uh, Dr. Paul Hasegawa, for putting together our speakers on Monday for IAG Day. And then Dr. Kenton Ross from Arkansas put together our Arkansas AGD Day on Tuesday. That was wonderful. Great speakers there. And then uh, today, uh, the, the Card P Day was put together uh, by uh, Dr. Peter Thompson, myself, and some help, uh, well, obviously from our speakers. Thanks for stepping up so quickly. Uh, we appreciate that. You'll see QR codes going by. Use those QR codes to register for the courses tomorrow, Friday, and Tuesday. Um, we've left up some of the other flyers there just so you could see who spoke this week. There was uh, some pretty uh, uh, exciting speakers and we really appreciate them doing that. I want to remind everybody that this free CE is coming to you from the Washington Academy of General Dentistry and we can only do this because our speakers, our presenters, our doctors, they are doing this for no honorarium and that, that's tremendous. We really appreciate that. Uh, just uh, every single person we asked said yes. So that, uh, that is wonderful. Uh, we appreciate it. University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department is handling your CE credits. If you have questions about Miss CE uh, that on a webinar that you attended, do not, that's a big do not, email Valerie at the Washington AGD. No, you want to contact the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. Uh, tomorrow, Dr. Manu Karbosh, you'll want to watch that presentation. She's putting together a uh, webinar really focused on the systems that we're going to use as a team when we get back into our, our offices on Tuesday, May 19th. So, I'm itching to be, get back into the office and do some dentistry, but it is going to be a different animal, that's for sure. Um, we've got some uh, courses coming up. You'll see those uh, on the flyers there. We have Crown Preparation 101 from Analog to Digital. This is a course I teach. That course is actually really designed for dental students and young dentists, young associates. The goal there is to walk uh, participants through a crown preparation from diagnosing why the tooth broke or has decay all the way to releasing them at the end of the appointment post-op uh, instructions, but with a real emphasis on the verbal skills and communication with the patient. So a lot of the students think that they're gonna sit down and just uh, learn what burrs to use where. That's not what that uh, course is about. And then we introduce them to um, Analog concepts and those, how those classic analog concepts apply to digital dentistry. So that uh, course has been moved a number of times because of COVID-19 and we're hoping to make that happen again in August. Alrighty, we're getting close to start time here. So I uh, want again, welcome you to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE Series. Uh, tremendous. We've got about half our participants into the webinar right now. For those of you that are new to the Zoom format, play around. You'll see that there's some buttons there. There's some features. There's the chat feature that allows uh, you to type in things like, hey, how's it going and that kind of stuff. And if you have a question for our speaker, put it in the Q&A tab, okay? And if you've got a question, take a look first. If somebody else has asked a similar question, just up the vote that. Thanks for putting your hands up there, but we won't be using the hands up feature today. If you have any questions, type them in the Q&A feature there, please. Uh, and Dr. Gary Hayamoto will be our panelist handling our chat today with information. You want to uh, maybe go off a of full screen and use, open up that chat feature so you can see the information that he's putting in there regarding um, uh, web addresses, uh, upcoming um, webinars, those type of things. So, all righty, we're getting... Uh, close. It's 2.28 here. Um, we will, uh, again, uh, be adding a whole week of webinars 
uh, probably Friday night, Saturday morning. So if you want to uh, go to WashingtonAGD.org, either Friday night or sometime Saturday, you'll be able to see next week's course offerings. We're uh, designing Monday to be opioid and suicide training. Uh, Tuesday is, uh, boy, oh boy, that's, uh, oh yeah, that's a, a program focused um, for uh, dentists and their staff members. Uh, we've got Dr. Marcus uh, Trolsch that's going to be presenting on PPE, aerosol stuff. And, uh, and then we're going to do some stuff with uh, reopening your office equipment uh, repair, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we've got uh, another speaker lined up Tuesday afternoon. We're going to continue with uh, the Braze on Wednesday, I believe, with more uh, CPA advice on PPB loans, etc. And uh, so we're just going to fill in with a few more um, uh, webinars here and there. And uh, we'll have basically a full uh, week of webinars next week. So uh, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you to all the people that are stepping up last minute to help us out with that because we're actually working on that as we speak. Um, it's 2.30, and uh, if it's 2.30, that's dental time. So I am going to, again, introduce all our sponsors before we welcome Dr. Ian Tester. Our sponsors include the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE Department, who is handling your CE credits. Those CE credits will appear in your email box in two to three business days. Look for a PDF. The PDF is not necessarily personalized. Just put your information on there. Save that for your licensing boards in your state or province. Um, those of you that are AGD members, we will be reporting your AGD credits directly to the Academy of General Dentistry. Those should show up on your transcripts within the next two to four weeks. Um, like to thank Comet USA and Patterson Dental for their support of this webinar series and the WAGD Educational Center. We'd like to thank Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, and Seattle Ken King County Dental Society. Today, we'd especially like to thank the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics for putting together our speakers. Thank you for being good colleagues and friends and helping with this whole series. We appreciate it. If you uh, have seen a webinar and you want to review that or share it with a colleague, please go to YouTube to Washington Academy of General Dentistry. That's our channel there. You can like, subscribe, and uh, click hit the bell there and you'll be notified of upcoming webinars. Um, the webinars will go on two to three hours after uh, the webinar completes here. It just takes a little time for us to transcode those and upload them. Hey, uh, we're not doing anything fancy with the editing on those right now. I'm sorry, there's you know some headers and footers on there, but just scroll through me. You don't need to listen to me tell you this stuff again. Um, like to thank the International Academy of Nathology and Arkansas Academy of uh, General Dentistry for putting speakers together for us this week. Well, uh, Dr. Tester, I think it's time for me to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to let you uh, bring up your screen there. Thank you, Timmy. I appreciate and, it very much. And I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction here. It looks like your mom wrote up your biography here. She's pretty proud of you. That's good to see. Uh, so uh, Dr. Ian Tester graduated from the University of Toronto with a DDS degree in 1982 and received a Master's of Science in Dental Sciences degree 
from Donau University in Krems, Austria in 2004 with a major emphasis on the treatment of the complicated patient utilizing orthodontics, prosthetic dentistry, physical therapy, and medical intervention. Dr. Tester practices general dentistry in St. Catharines, Ontario, with a focus on multidisciplinary treatment of the complex dental patient. He is a member of many professional and educational organizations in the U.S. and Canada, and a fellow of the International College of Dentists, Academy of Dentists International, and the American College of Dentists. He is a founding member of the International Academy of Advanced Interdisciplinary Dentistry. Dr. Tester lectures in the U.S., and Canada on the topics of TMD, function and dysfunction, aesthetic and restorative dentistry, occlusion, and prosthetics. Welcome, Dr. Tester, and thank you very much. Uh, it, it is a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you very much, Timmy, for the kind introduction. And if we're ready, we'll get our screen going here. And there we go. First, I'd like to say good afternoon from Niagara on the Lake in Ontario, Canada. It's a pleasure to join you on a day that celebrates continuing education, which is exactly the reason for the existence of both the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prosthodontics and the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Today, we're going to walk down a road that twists and turns. As the title, Condylar Position, Centric Relation versus Reference Position, The Great Debate, would indicate any discussion about condylar position has historically been fraught with conflicting opinions. Now, I don't embark on this journey with you without recognizing the challenge. But if I'm successful, you'll leave this webinar with valuable information that you can readily apply and you'll have a clear understanding of why we need to consider a condylar position in everyday dentistry and how to record it. The journey was originally charted by my mentor, Professor Dr. Rudolf Slavicek. He's the former Dean of the University of Vienna and one of the foremost thinkers in medicine and dentistry of our time. He's added much to our profession and as you will see, he's brought a lifetime of study to the current practice of dentistry clarifying much of the dogma, bias, and belief systems of the past. I'm proud to be a lecturer for the Vienna School of Interdisciplinary Dentistry, VSID, at the beautiful University of Vienna, Austria. Here we instruct our postgraduate students in comprehensive diagnosis and treatment planning based on the teachings of Dr. Slavicek. As my only disclosure, I'm equally proud of VSED Canada. With my lecturing partner, Dr. Kim Parlett and I, we teach the same 15-day program that we give in Vienna to our North American colleagues. We hold this course in Ancaster, Ontario. Now we all graduate from dental school with a basic level of knowledge. This is kind of like having 2100 dental vision. Our mission should be to continually search for knowledge that improves our diagnostic vision. Eventually, we hope to reach the ability to see beyond 2020. Over the past four decades, there's been a gradual erosion of teaching in the field of occlusal medicine in dental schools. Now, why is that? Allow me to share with you my top 10 list of reasons that occlusal medicine is not taught. Number one, the past research is full of dogma and bias, which has led to skepticism amongst dentists. Number two, a link to TMD was not established early on and occlusion, the baby, was thrown out with the bathwater, meaning TMDs. Confusion, there's so many philosophies and variety of concepts that it's easier just to ignore the entire thing. The lack of teachers. The old masters have retired and or passed on, and two or three generations later, their message is being diluted or forgotten. There's the difficulty of doing research, controls and isolating variables, and having done research in this area, I quickly realized how complex our stomatognathic system is 
and how hard research is to do. Good research is not, often, is not always published in English journals. And the adoption of philosophies, not science, is pervasive in inclusal medicine. Nevertheless, it is a science and therefore it's inherently complex. It doesn't appear to be an immediate return on investment, although I'll argue that point shortly. And finally, number 10, it's not possible to teach well in a short lecture format, which of course is the way most of our dental CE is currently taught. So let's look at the return on investment of occlusal medicine. With a good knowledge of occlusion, we reduce remakes, increase patient comfort, we can increase the longevity of the dentition and our restorations. We'll reduce the iatrogenic possibilities. And we do larger, more complicated cases with better precision and a higher return. And finally, dentist professional satisfaction is greatly increased. So what dental disciplines need to consider occlusal medicine? I'd contend that occlusion is important in all dentistry practiced today. As we embark on our journey, I want you to reflect on when you think you need to know about condylar position. I developed this concept called the hierarchy of dental treatment to summarize and explain. This inverted pyramid reveals procedures that have increased complexity from levels one through six. Level one is our basic responsibility, the elimination of pain and infection. Level two is the simple treatment of teeth one by one. And this is the bare minimum that dental education leaves us with as we exit dental school. But I liken this to shopping at Walmart. Our patients perceive that our care is like buying a blender. You can get one at Walmart, or you can get the same one at Macy's. You just go buy the cheapest blender. Developing a relationship with a patient is hard to do at this level, as they often base choice by price. At level three, we begin to look at the patient's presenting conditions in a broader sense. We diagnose and treat a collection of problems as a group in their presenting maximum intercuspation. At level four, we're starting to include more complex aesthetic dentistry and reconstruction. Level five introduces complex interdisciplinary treatment of a functional system, which starts with an assessment of the patient's overall function. And finally, level six is the most challenging area of dentistry where we require all of our skill sets. As the patient's dysfunctional and excellent diagnostic skills are the only way to achieve success. So when is a knowledge of condylar position necessary? The reality is it's important at all levels. Although if you aspire to do dentistry above level two, it's essential. To repeat, understanding condylar position is critical to proper diagnosis. It's necessary to elevate your practice to the highest levels. And for all of us who practice in the 21st century, we've heard the term centric elation and possibly reference position. But what's the difference and why the debate? Let's begin. For us to ignore how teeth affect the temporomandibular joint region, and reciprocally, how the joints affect the teeth. It's kind of like looking at the foreground of a scene. We only see the trees, but we miss what lays beyond. In this lecture, we'll define the term centric relation and reference position. We're gonna discuss the challenges of research, past and present. We're gonna understand the importance of using a reference position in diagnosis. And we're going to describe a bite registration technique to capture reference position. Now to understand where we are, it's usually wise to look back at where we came from. 
The process of evolutionary upwriting has created significant change in how we balance our skull on two small facet joints on our spine. This has had profound implications on how our temporomandibular joints function relative to our ancestors. Now, as we've evolved, our skull has uprighted, skull has uprighted to accommodate our vertical posture. This means quite a balancing act as we look at the horizon. This is a ponged skull. Take a look at the fossa and particularly the posterior wall. It's a rigid backstop to posterior movement of the mandible. In a close-up look, we see that there's a complete bony restriction to retral or posterior movement of the condyle. Now let's look at the human temporomandibular joint. Here, there is no prominent retral bony stop. Unlike the pongids, this lack of retral stability can make understanding mandibular movements more complicated. The lack of a rigid fence posteriorly allows the possibility of more movement of the condyles in three dimensions. Now it's common to think of mandibular movement like a nutcracker, opening and closing around a hinge joint. Much of dentistry today is done assuming that this is the only movement that our mandible undertakes. But of course, functional movements, which include swallowing, chewing, speaking, bruxing, etc., are dynamic in nature, and they exhibit rotational and translational movements. We know the temporomandibular joints are complex, and in this dissection, we see the articular disc and the bilaminar zone posterior to the condyle which acts as an adaptable cushion against retro or posterior movement, as there's no bony wall like in the pongids. In addition, we see the superior head of the lateral pterygoid and the inferior head of the lateral pterygoid anteriorly. The condyles are capable of movement with six degrees of freedom. This means up, down, left, right, front, and back. In addition to sagittal movement, which can occur when there is condylar bony change and or ligament damage, the condyle is capable of movement anteriorly, controlled by muscles, cranially, called compression, which is again created by muscles and aggravated by tooth interferences. Inferiorly, term distraction, again, muscle or tooth interference created, and posteriorly with bony change, deflection by the teeth, or ligament damage. So why should we study condylar position anyway? Well, all diagnosis in orthodontics, restorative dentistry, and prosthodontics must include an understanding of temporomandibular joint health. We know that functional movements begin and end from close to the same starting position. And knowing this baseline point, we can properly assess and improve function. Inherently, we know condylar position matters. We know that compression, distraction, and other pathologic changes to the joint can occur. If we don't understand how to assess these, our treatments are prone to failure. And knowledge of a position that enhances function and reduces the possibility of damage is key. Improper condylar position can and does lead to strain on the neuromuscular system and the cranial mandibular system. Finally, if we're going to base our diagnosis and eventual treatment on the starting position, it must be repeatable. Let's study these points one by one. All diagnosis must include an understanding of temperamental joint health. 
Professor Slavicek introduced the cybernetic model of what a feedback control system looks like in the masticatory organ. As you can see by this diagram, the environment encompasses the organism, which in turn affects the masticatory organ. Of importance for this lecture, let's focus on the left side structures, the occlusion, the neuromuscular system, and the craniomandibular system. Now you'll have noted in the cybernetic model that we define the region of the temporomandibular joints as the craniomandibular system or the CMS. It refers to the structural unit that connects the mandible to the cranial base and it includes the bony structures of the jaw, the extended and passive centering and protective ligaments, and the active centering musculature. The components of the craniomandibular system are the basic osseous structures, including the condylar process, the articular eminence, the temporomandibular joint, the middle ear, and the temporal bone. The ligamentary suspension of the mandible and the hyoid bone includes the sphenomandibular ligament, the stylomandibular ligament, and the stylohyoid ligament. The temporomandibular joint is comprised of the joint capsule, with the capsular and temporomandibular ligament, the articular disc, and the retrodiscal tissues. And finally, the CMS muscles include the lateral pterygoid superior head, the deep head of the masseter, and in 30% of the cases, the frontal head of the temporalis muscle. So let's look at the opening motion of the mandible dynamically. Now we know that there's a combination of translation in the upper joint space and rotation in the lower joint space. The movements are created by muscles which are part of the neuromuscular system and the borders of movement are defined by ligaments. It's readily obvious from this very important diagram that the two condyles and the teeth are fixed via the mandible. So whatever affects the teeth will have an impact on the joints. And of course, whatever affects the joints will inevitably affect the teeth. In this video, we can see the interplay between the teeth and the joints. The teeth dictate the position of the joint, not vice versa. Now, let's take a close look at these selections of various occlusions. Note that the variety is infinite and the teeth when placed together in maximum intercuspation, MIP, or also called intercuspal position, ICP, it will dictate where the condyles go within their fossa. For example, what influence do you think these very tight anterior occlusions might have on the condyles? With these very retroclined upper incisors, there might be a posterior or retral positioning of the condyles over time as the inevitable wear and tear on the teeth continues. Now this is a critical point. We know that over time, there is significant change occurring in both joints and the teeth as we age. Multiple studies document that this is actually normal. Now, our mission as dentists is to understand this in the context of planning ideal treatment for our patients. Now, we can see in this study that 64% of the 20 to 40 age group, 88% of the 41 to 60, and 92% of the over 61 crowd show condylar changes. Now, what does this mean for our patient care? As bony changes occur, the reduction in condylar bone mass will inherently cause the ligament borders to be looser, allowing more lateral and posterior movement. Distraction or compression of the condyles, which can be secondary to the influence of the teeth, can complicate things by making the joints less stable. This can eventually lead to translation in both the upper and lower joint spaces, damaging the discs and potentially inflaming the bilaminar zone. 
Now we see these changes in condylar shape every day in our practices. As we age, cracks, fractures, and loss of vitality on our 12-year molars are a few of the observable consequences. It's critical that we understand why these common occurrences happen, and this has to be part of our diagnosis. And again, a key component to this assessment is knowing where the condyle is and if this position is acceptable and repeatable. Because our condyles will inevitably change their shape and stability over time, it's imperative that we diagnose based on joint health first and tooth location second. It's critical that we relate our diagnostics to our patient's function, not just a static set of models. So how would you describe the journey from point A to point B? Is it easier to pick a spot along the journey and just describe to someone where we've come from and where we're going? Or would it be easier to find that exact position again? I don't think so. Or would it be better to explain the journey by saying we always start at A and we end at B, knowing that we can always go back to the start with accuracy that is repeatable and reference our point on the journey to the starting point. Put another way, we have a fixed reference point to measure from that stays the same. But on our journey, we're studying translation of the mandible from a retral position to a protrusive position and back again. Here too, it's ideal to have a repeatable starting position. Now, of course, we're all aware of the term centric relation. The definition in the glossary of prosthodontic terms, GPT-9, is listed here. I'm going to read it for you. It's a maxillomandibular relationship independent of tooth contact in which the condyles articulate in the anterior superior position against the posterior slopes of the articular eminences. In this position, the mandible is restricted to a purely rotary movement. And from this unstrained, physiologic, maxillomandibular relationship, the patient can make vertical, lateral, or protrusive movements. It's a clinically useful, repeatable reference position. Now let's break the definition down into individual concepts. The first, a maxillomandibular relationship independent of tooth contact. So do you agree with this statement? Well, let's vote. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Yes, in all our concepts, we need to look at the joint first without the influence of the teeth. So yes, thumbs up on this one. The next part, in which the condyles articulate in the anterior superior position against the posterior slopes of the articular eminences. Of course, in a healthy joint, this is ideal with the biconcave disc in place, which is designed to be loaded. The question becomes, what if the disc is not in place? Where is CR? What if the disc is perforated? How about if the condyle is functioning on the posterior band of the disc? What if one joint has a degenerative condition and maybe the other joint is fine? Will this cause a shift of the mandible transversally? Of course it does. So how does this affect the statement that the condyles articulate in the anterior superior position against the posterior slope of the eminence? What's our vote? While this statement is true in health, as we've seen, there is a change with time. And how do we account for this? I vote thumbs down as the statement is not always accurate. In this position, the mandible is restricted to a purely rotary movement. While this is usually the case, what if there's ligament laxity? This could be directly due to ligament tears, or indirectly due to reduction of bone mass, meaning the condyle is shrunk. The result can be retral translation in the lower joint space. So again, how do we vote? 
I vote thumbs down as the statement is not universal. So the next part of the GPT-9 definition is from this unstrained physiologic maxillomandibular mandibular relationship, the patient can make vertical, lateral, or protrusive movements. It's true that our translatory movements emanate from a position, this position. Yes, we'll give a thumbs up on this one. And it's a clinically useful, repeatable reference position. As I mentioned in our introduction, it's necessary to have a repeatable reference position for a diagnosis. But the question is, is CR always repeatable? As we shall see, that can depend on technique and joint health. So as it's not always universal, once again, we have to vote thumbs down. So what's the score? The GPT-9 overall record using these criteria is two thumbs up and three thumbs down. Certainly a possible basis of some, some confusion in acceptance of this definition of CR. Now let's look at the definition by the American Dental Association in 2006. Centric relation is the position of the mandible when the condyles are orthopedically stable. This happens when the condyles are in the more anterior superior position in the glenoid fossa, while staying posteriorly to the articular eminence with the disc properly interposed. This position is independent of dental contact, rather similar, but again, we are assuming an ideal joint situation. So this definition is not universal. Historically, there have been a number of different definitions. This study by Jason Vichitz in 2000 shows the controversies created by the variety of CR definitions. And the results in this survey suggested that the controversy will continue because to date, there was no consensus regarding the definition of centric elation within the seven dental schools that he surveyed. This graphic depicts seven different historical philosophies. It's no wonder that confusion has led many to ignore the importance of finding this position. So let's travel back in time to look at a few key papers that have influenced the current concepts of condylar reference position. As I walk you through these articles, I'll identify some key takeaways. First, we'll look at Dr. Victor Lucia's 1964 JPD paper a technique for recording centric relation. He noted that it was important to remove the proprioceptive tooth contact, thereby eliminating muscle engrams. He used an anterior jig, the Lucia jig, which was equilibrated to ensure evenly spaced separation in the posterior teeth and even contact on the anterior teeth. Lucia used a gothic arch traced on the anterior jig with the apex being the most retro part of mandibular movement. A medium was injected between the posterior teeth registering the maxillary mandibular relationship. Three bites were recommended per patient as the end could be split casted using mounted models. This technique necessitated an increased vertical dimension which he recommended needed to be minimized. Now I want you to pay particular attention to these four principles highlighted here as we go further in our lecture today. Next, we'll look at Dr. Frank Salenza's paper, The Centric Position, Replacement and Character from the JPD in 1973. No matter what record is used, it must be reproducible and consistent. The condyles must be symmetrically positioned. This references the force applied. Reproducibility is dependent on the limiting structures of the temporomandibular joint. Nature adapts slowly to the centric occlusion position, both with the neuromuscular system and the ligaments. But what about prosthetics and orthodontics? 
when we do these two procedures, they're not slow. 15 subjects that were class one with no TMDs, full dentitions, six, and all their anteriors were studied. Again, he used Gothic arch tracings, and he noted that centric relation is a mechanical position that we can return to for referencing our position. But it's not necessarily a position used naturally. The results most repeatable position that he found was with chin point guidance from directly in front of the patient controlling the production of the Gothic arch. Again, key in on these first three principles. Our next paper, we'll be looking at Dr. Harry Lundeen's published article, Centric Relation Records, the Effect of Muscle Action in the JPD 1974. So Dr. Lundeen used a Bunograph system, which is similar to a SAM MPI or a gamma CPM to study eight patients with no TMD symptoms and a full set of teeth. He did a hinge axis recording and a kinematic face bow, which was then used to ensure no rotational distortion and to mount the upper models. Now he did two different methods to record centric relation. In the first, he used chin point guidance to ensure the mandible was in its most retral position and created an anterior stop in wax. The first registration used heavy patient muscular closure with an anterior stop on the chilled wax and did a posterior aluwax bite. In the second method, he used a light patient closure with an anterior acrylic stop and a posterior zoe bite. And then he repeated the testing using a myomonitor and resin bites. So what were the results? In 1A, the position was determined to be the most superior condylar position from the reference hinge axis mounting. And this makes sense as there was more muscular force used. In 1B, the average position was closest to the reference hinge axis and also inferior to 1A. And finally, the myomonitor with the resin bites was not repeatable and the average bite was below the hinge axis reference position. Finally, we're going to take a look at Dr. Peter Dawson's paper, The New Definition for Relating Occlusion to Varying Conditions of the Temporomandibular Joint, published in the JPD in 1995. Dr. Dawson noted that centric relation is the accepted term for defining condylar position of an intact, completely seated joint with properly aligned condyle disc assemblies. He noted that there was a range of deformed TM joints from partial to full disc derangements with or without reduction, which can function normally. He termed this adapted centric posture or ACP. The four criteria he noted for centric relation included the disc being properly aligned on both condyles, the condyle disc assembly at the highest point possible against the posterior eminence, the medial pole of each condyle disc assembly was braced by bone, and the inferior head of the lateral pterygoid had released its contraction and was passive. Now, in adapted centric posture, the same criteria apply. If ACP cannot be determined, then we need a new treatment position. For example, if there was pain, and the treatment position was used if you couldn't find centric relation or an adapted centric posture. As I mentioned, it was done to relieve pain and also to eventually provide condylar stabilization. Professor Slavicek recognized the lack of consensus and decided to take a fresh look at the very important concept, condylar position. Most importantly, he assimilated the salient points from these and many other papers and defined a more encompassing thought process. So let's look at this. He proposed looking at the temporomandibular joints as we look at other joints in the body. Caves and Roberts in the landmark study, 1936, proposed the neutral zero method, 
which recognize that all joints have a range of motion, an area of hypermobility, and a neutral zero point, which is the starting point for function. These graphics show the original charts for the orthopedic zero position of different joints of the body. So the question becomes, what is the neutral zero position for the craniomandibular system? It's critical to understand that all joints have a neutral zero position, which is an unstrained border position dictated by bony structures and ligaments. This is the case with your knee, your elbow, and the temporomandibular joint. In a healthy temporomandibular joint, the ligaments are intact and the disc is in place. As the condyle moves anteriorly, the disc follows. At the retro border of translation, the discocondylar ligament, which is shown in red in the upper left diagram, and originally was described by Zenker, it becomes taut, limiting further posterior movement. This position has been proven through research to be reproducible. And we use this as our zero reference position or neutral zero position for diagnosis and treatment planning. The definition of this reference position or RP is the unstrained retro border of mandibular translation, which is patient derived. I'll explain this further, but let's summarize this very important point. RP is the diagnostic baseline or a zero position. The definite is, once again, the unstrained retral border of the mandible from which movements start. We use RP or reference position for the analysis of all of our cases, whether the joints are healthy or not. This position is independent of teeth, and our TRP, which is our treatment position, is planned from this position So what's the difference between RP and CR? Centric relation is a point relationship of the lower jaw in the glenoid fossa. It's a manipulated position, often using leaf gauge or by manual manipulation. And usually centric relation is the treatment position. Reference position on the other hand is a position of the mandible. It's non-manipulated and we use chin point guidance to ensure the patient is purely doing rotation. Now we can use reference position as a starting point to find a treatment position if appropriate, i.e. if we don't want to accept the reference position as our treatment position. But the key is to understand that RP, reference position, provides diagnostic information, just like range of motion, muscle palpation, and joint auscultation. It's not used by itself, but it's part of a larger diagnostic picture. Now the question we presented was, is reference position useful to study function? In this graphic, we see dynamic function in action. As we chew on our right side, which would be the working side, we see the mandible open and drop protrusively forward rather symmetrically. The right condyle on the working side here goes back first, followed by the left condyle. When the right condyle reaches its posterior ligamentous, ligamentous retral border, the left condyle is only about half the way back. Now, as the left condyle finally reaches home, the CMS muscles become active as we close. Let's look at this from the side. This is a classic picture from Drs. Lundin and Gibbs and their Nathic replicator studies done in the late 70s and early 80s. Using a mainframe computer and a sensitive jaw tracking device, they studied the movement of the hinge axis. This diagram shows the protrusive motion in red as the mandible opens and protrudes to intake food. The green pathway reveals the retrusive motion to the retro border, where the final motion in yellow is a subtle 
cranial and anterior motion as the CMS muscles activate. Now, yes, this is the retral pathway reached by the, which is the unstrained retral border defined by ligaments in a healthy joint. Next, we'll look at reasons that condylar position matters. Remember that the teeth dictate the condylar position. So it makes sense to plan our treatments from a healthy joint position and make sure the teeth fit this scheme and not vice versa. When we close with the condyle in its most posterior unstrained retral border position, i.e. RP, the teeth are going to eventually touch. We define this as RCP, the retral contact position. Otherwise stated, the initial contact of a tooth or teeth along the retruded path of closure about a transverse horizontal rotational axis. ICP or intercuspal position, which is synonymous with maximum intercuspation or MIP, is then defined as the complete intercuspation of the opposing teeth independent of condylar position. It's sometimes referred to as the best fit of the teeth regardless of condylar position. From this initial contact point, a slide from RCP to ICP must be assessed for effect on the temporomandibular joint. Now many RCP to ICP slides are within 0.5 millimeters at the level of the joint, and likely they're not that detrimental. But what if they're more significant? At the level of the joint, they can create compression or distraction. And at the level of the teeth, they can create increased muscular involvement to close to ICP. This is called centric slide. Now it's critical that our cases respect this principle in orthodontics and prosthodontics, as we want to finish with a stable RCP equal to ICP. Look at the difference between RCP and ICP in these photos. If the masticatory organ has to compensate for this large discrepancy between RCP and ICP every time the patient swallows, what do you think will happen? To emphasize the importance of studying condylar position in our diagnosis, I'd like to present a few slides from this case study. Although appearing very simple on the surface, I believe you'll be surprised at what the organized and complete diagnostic protocol revealed. Our patient is 18 year old Brooke. And she came with a chief complaint of having limited opening for the last three weeks, which began when she opened to eat a sandwich. She described having problems with her jaw after orthodontic treatment, which was completed at the age of 14. She had clicking. Frontally, Brooke has a very pleasing smile. And also, as we zoom in, a very acceptable aesthetic result. We see in these images some subtle clues of minor issues. Wear on the left canines, a midline shift. However, the photos look like an acceptable result. Profile and arch forms look acceptable orthodontically. Brooke's medical history was non-contributory. And similarly, her dental history was also non-contributory other than the aforementioned orthodontic treatment. Note that Brooke is class one in ICP. But again, this is her orthodontically treated occlusion in maximum intercuspation. Her overbite was 30% and her overjet was 0 1, a nice result. The occlusal index is a method of quantifying the level of dysfunction the patient is experiencing using a series of 10 standardized questions with rankings zero to three done subjectively by the patient. 
Note that 2.33 is a moderate to severe level of dysfunction. Also, take note of the fact that our patient has had joint noises and pain on her right side and tooth 1.6 is sensitive. Now remember that. She noted that this had been present for some time, however, no one could figure out why. Our muscle palpation shows acute tenderness in the anterior temporalis, right superficial and left deep masseter, and the left and right medial pterygoid, which often indicates a repetitive movement of the mandible sagittally. Perhaps this is an avoidance mechanism. Brooks' range of motion helps tell the tale. By extending the lower midline up to the upper tooth, we can track the movements laterally. She goes three millimeters left and eight millimeters right. For sure, something's up. In protrusion, we see a six millimeter limited movement with a deviation of three millimeters to the right. Opening was limited at 21 millimeters and there was a deviation to the right of three millimeters. And she had pain in the region of her right temporomandibular joint. Now take special note of the RCP contacts. Also the lateral obtrusive or working side guidance. While the static occlusal of the models looks well formed, let's look at the models mounted in RP at RCP. After deprogramming, we see the real occlusion, which is now joint based. Using RP as our condylar reference point explains the sensitivity in tooth 1.6. It likely also explains the muscle palpation re results and quite probably a potential etiologic factor. The orthodontics was, case was finished in ICP and not with the checking for RCP equal to ICP. Here's her model analysis. And note that the working side guidance and initial contact on the models. If this case was finished with ICP equal to RCP, it would have ended better. For those of you familiar with condylography, the tracings revealed a closed lock, reduced quantity, and poor quality of tracing. And the CBCT and the MRI confirm the diagnosis. So once again, in all disciplines of dentistry, it's imperative that we treat our cases with a joint-based diagnosis. If we just focus on the teeth, we risk missing significant information. Finally, now that we understand condylar position and why it's critical as part of our diagnosis, we need to make sure that the position we're using is repeatable. Now, most of the classic research on centric relation was done using a series of bite registrations at the level of the teeth. Now we can certainly prove that successive bite registrations are the same at the level of the teeth, but this does not necessarily mean that the condylar position is in the correct location, nor is it repeatable at the level of the temporomandibular joints. So I'd like to share with you an important part of my own personal educational journey. My master's thesis in 2004 set out to prove that the leaf gauge could provide a repeatable centric relation position when measured at the level of the joint. This was accomplished using electronic condylography, which again is a system validated by numerous studies in sensitivity and specificity. By investigating the effect of the joint level, it was possible to study both condylar position and repeatability of successive RP bite registrations. In these photos, we see the leaf gauge as well as the electric condylograph, electronic condylograph in place. The condylar position is recorded at the level of the joint by the computer 
which allows us to assess the convalence six degrees of freedom while studying multiple byte registrations and the repeatability. Once again, what is condylography? It's a non-invasive recording of the movements of the temporomandibular joints in three dimensions dynamically. We find it necessary for extensively, extensive diagnosis of function and dysfunction. The system is developed into a sophisticated electronic computerized recorder backed by comprehensive and excellent research. Another advantage of the condylography is that it allows us to do a true kinematic at the true hinge axis face bow recording, which is critical when our treatment changes vertical dimension as it keeps the true rotational center. Here we see a graphic of the tracings that condylography produces. To explain simply what you're seeing, it's a protrusion path of the condyle from RP to maximum protrusion and back again. So back to the study. There were 32 patients in the study, each with healthy temporomandibular joints. I had a strict protocol for what constituted health and this was adhered to. The subjects were divided into groups by, of eight by skeletal type using cephalometrics. There were four groups, class one, class two division one and two, and class three. This was totaling 32 patients. The data was then re-stratified into three groups by skull type, mesofacial, dolichofacial, and brachyfacial. And finally, the data was also once again re-stratified by sagittal condylar inclination, which is the same thing as horizontal condylar inclination. The repeatability of finding the reference position was studied for all of these parameters to see if they affected the results. For each patient, a stable ICP position was confirmed using condylography, and this was used as a repeatable baseline to measure from. Now, this doesn't mean the ICP position was a correct position. It was just a repeatable point in space to give us a fixed reference point for measurement. The change in condylar position at the level of the hinge axis after leaf gauging, as per Dr. Eugene Williamson, was measured with electronic condylography. Recorded movement of the hinge axis was measured using an XYZ Cartesian coordinate system called the axis orbital system. And each measurement was done three times per patient. So a series of scatter plots were created and these were statistically analyzed as to repeatability. Ideally, the plots would show consistent overlapped reference position positions for each patient. And the results were the condylar position at the level of the joint, as determined by leaf gauge position, was highly variable. It certainly didn't coincide with the ICP position, and we found that the leaf gauge could alter the dental class by up to half, dental classification by up to a half a class. My conclusion was the use of the leaf gauge was not repeatable at the level of the joint. But I also did side studies involving chin point guidance as per Dr. Slavicek, and by manual manipulation as per Dr. Dawson. My colleague, Dr. Jean-Guy Violette from New Brunswick did the same protocol with neuromuscular techniques. The bottom line was that every time we touch a patient, we affect repeatability. The patient responds potentially with a counter reaction to our application of pressure. We found that the least invasive technique was chin point guidance, meaning it was the most repeatable. Now, if you think back to our research, we saw with Lucia and Silenza, they utilized chin point pressure in a light way and a gothic arch at minimal vertical opening. Lundin determined a light patient closure force would provide the ideal position. We used chin point guidance in a relaxed patient by gently controlling the closet movement of the mandible when it's in its retro border position with as little opening as possible. And we have the patient undergo a controlled closing rotation. This was the most repeatable technique. And also this position corresponds to our previous definition of reference position. 
So what are the recording principles for chin point guidance? They include initially deprogramming the muscles if required, using only gentle chin point control to ensure rotation at the unstrained retral border. And we use a registration material of low vertical dimension, providing minimum resistance during the closing. Now about deprogramming. The patient should be at rest and upright. We have them undergo several protrusion retrusion or opening and closing movements. This stretches the muscles and fills the joint chamber with synovial fluid. Essentially, it's lubrication. We deprogram for a minimum of four to six minutes, separating the dental arches with an anterior flat plane, a central bearing pin, or gently closing on cotton rolls placed in the region of the six year molars. Given the potential for every manipulation to create a patient's counter reaction, we only use light forces with chin point guidance. We ensure the mandible doesn't translate forward with our light touch. As I said, the patient is relaxed and sitting upright and we approach directly from the front so we don't induce any untoward forces. During the closing process, the CMS muscles position the condyle against the articular eminence. It's kind of a semi-active technique. Dr. Slavicek's words, we don't take the bite, but the patient provides us with it. We avoid tooth contact. It's dominated by the neuromuscular system and the ligamentary apparatus. So multiple articles exist in support of these techniques. If you want to photograph this page in the next, I'll leave it up just for a second. Recall our discussion of condylography. It does allow us to study the effect of our RP bites at the level of the joint in real time. The question you're going to have is what do we use to do the bite registration? Initially, we'll look at one technique in depth using Beauty Pink Extra Hard Base Plate Wax with Aluwax. I'll also reference three other excellent techniques. The PrimoBite Base Plate with the PrimoBite Detail Paste, an anterior resin bite stop with lateral Beauty Pink wax strips, keeping a minimum vertical opening and a central bearing pin without the arrowhead tracing. We use split casting to ensure repeatability of our registrations, and we do at least three. We can also check repeatability when doing electronic condylography in real time at the level of the joints. Like Lucia, we do the three bytes and check with the split cast at the level of the teeth. So let's look at the step-by-step -step preparation. Once again, we use Beauty Pink Extra Hard Wax, double fold it, warming it in a water bath at 54 degrees centigrade. The wax is pressed firmly on the upper cast to have the imprints of the buccal cusps recorded. Now, if the wisdom teeth are present, the wax plate doesn't exceed past half the occlusal surface as it would interfere. And for the stability of the lower model during later mounting, we try to get as many teeth as possible recorded in the plate. This can also be done directly in the mouth. The imprints of the cusps and the incisal edges of the upper teeth should be well seen at a depth of about one millimeter. This is the finished design of the base plate. In one step, while the wax is soft enough, we can usually do this and cut it. We make sure that the wax is trimmed flush with the buccal cusps so we can easily visualize the seating of the wax wafer on the teeth. We make sure that the wax fits in a stable manner against the upper teeth. 
and we hold it in place with thumb and forefinger of our non-dominant hand. The other hand is used to provide the chin point guidance. Once in the mouth, we use a perio probe to mark prematurities on the wax. The plate is then removed, and these areas that we marked are trimmed until we get even, simultaneous contact in four separated areas, ideally around the region of the cuspids and the posterior molars. Finally, we mark the areas of contacts with the probe in the mouth, remove the wax, and indicate where we'll add our aliwax with a Sharpie. Aliwax, of course, has aluminum in it, which retains heat, keeping the wax at an ideal consistency for the reference position bite. Initially, when we put the wax on, it's shiny, but we wait until it dulls and then do our registration. Once completed, we recheck the bite in the mouth afterwards. There should be absolutely no transversal or anterior posterior deviation when we retry. This is an example of the finished reference position bite. When it's well done, we have only cusp tips in the aliwax and they're well distributed spatially and not deeper than 0.5 millimeters. This is enough stability for the lower model to be properly mounted and we can easily visualize seating of the cast in the wax. Another method is using PrimoBite. We use this with the PrimoBite detail paste in the same manner, although there's typically a small flat anterior landing area at the front of the PrimoBite paste plate. It's created to lightly separate the teeth posteriors with a paste. Third technique uses an anterior stop at a minimal opening and posterior beauty pink extra hard wax strips. Light carrying plastics as a base and composite or aluwax as a detail paste also can be utilized. The final technique we'll cover today uses a central bearing pin. Once this is fabricated and in a proper place, a rigid medium is injected between the plates to register reference position. Now, Dr. Elad Yuri, one of our co-instructors at the VSED, studied the repeatability of reference position registrations for his master's thesis. Elad used a 3D digitizer to measure three coordinates of the same lower model mounted to the same upper model 100 times. One registration in ICP and three registration techniques for a grand total of 33 times. He used the three techniques, Primo Bite, Gothic Arch, and our Wax Bite. In the summary, he found that the reference position bite done this way is highly reproducible. As Dr. Parlett earlier mentioned, just a quick shout out and congratulations for this excellent paper Dr. Yuri's that was just published in February in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry. The conclusion would be that reference position with chin point guidance is reproducible and technique is the key. Now let's summarize. A neutral zero position exists for all joints. 
Reference position is the unstrained retro border dictated by the discocondylar ligament. RCP to ICP slides can induce compression or distraction, thereafter creating dysfunction. The RP position is independent of teeth, and our TRP, or treatment position, is planned from this position based on the myriad of other diagnostic techniques that we use in combination with using and finding reference position. So finally, how can we achieve ultimate success as a dentist? I believe there are five main steps to achieve happiness both personally and professionally. The first being work-life balance. A happy home life and the support of family is necessary to enjoy your practice life. Patient comfort. This one step will help retain patients and build your reputation. Team support. This goes both ways, and a happy team that buys into the importance of what you're doing, combined with your personal integrity, will ensure that your practice grows in all aspects. The development of our clinical skills is ultimately why we all are here today, and it is what will sustain us as we go through our careers. Knowing the importance of occlusal medicine will allow us to speak from a position of confidence with our patients. And once our patients understand that we have their best interest at heart, we can achieve the dream of most practicing dentists, providing excellent care and a happy environment on people that we care about. Understanding condylar position is absolutely critical to these principles. I want to thank you for joining us today and a heartfelt thank you to Cardup and the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, of course to Valerie and to Timmy Hess, my friend, for this kind invitation. I wish you good health and happiness. Well, thank you very much. Uh, really enjoyed that. Nice slides, really, really nice Thanks, slides. Thanks, uh, we, We've got some questions and I know we'll get more questions. So if you haven't uh, looked in the Q&A section, Take a look in there. If you have a question, feel free to put it in and uh, we'll uh, just tackle some of these. So uh, is it currently possible to purchase Dr. Slavik's uh, book? To my knowledge, yes, it is. The best way to find it would be to go online, uh, check out visid, V-I-E-S-I-D.com in uh, Vienna. And there, uh, that will actually bring you to Gamma. Uh, and Gamma is actually the company that provides the materials and the books and also um, a lot of the uh, equipment that we use. So be Gamma Dental in Austria, but you can probably access that through vset.com. Thank you. Uh, can you comment on second molar crown preparations with interact inadequate interarch space following crown reduction, you know, occlusal reduction? <laughs> <laughs> Meaning something that we tend to have to deal with every day. Yes. I think, yeah. And, and, and uh, to hearken back to where I was talking about the changes as our condyles um, uh, adapt and wear over time. And that's, I believe, why we see that interarch distance change so much. Um, there's a lot of studies that show after the age of 35 to 40, it's absolutely normal to have that happen. So what's happening is the condyle is flattening the condyle's seeding more just because there's less bone mass and the pressure just biomechanically goes directly to those sevens, shortening them up. Now the question is, how do you prepare that? And I think it's a complicated question in some cases and simple in others. Uh, like you, Tim, I mean, I'm an absolute gold fan and I don't think I've done anything but gold on sevens in maybe the last five years. Uh, in saying that, there's preparation techniques, which you're more qualified than myself to talk about, but uh, that will allow us to gain retention on those short teeth. And I think it's the only viable and intelligent material to use in those situations. I have a huge um, challenge in my mind with using zirconia in these areas. And the reason I'm going to say that is, number one, the challenge of actually getting it to bond. But number two, 
using the hardest substance that we dentally have in a position where uh, we need something that's going to have to wear along with the rest of the dentition, I'm not sure zirconia is a good, a good option for that situation. Yeah, we'll have to see. Uh, along the lines of preparation, for those of you that didn't catch one of our uh, early webinars, Dr. Lane Ochi, go to our YouTube channel, watch his presentation. It, it, just absolutely excellent and, uh, and about creating uh, secondary uh, retention features and short crown preparations. Okay, uh, here's a question. When I was taught deprogramming, cotton rolls were placed between the incisors why do you recommend placing them on the molars? The idea with the cotton rolls is just to keep the teeth apart, to remove the muscle engrams that are built in by having the, the slide from RCP to ICP. I don't like having uh, the patient just open with no support in the posterior. And frankly, half my patients, no, probably more than half my patients are so dysfunctional. That alone could be a bit of a challenge. So I like to do it back around the six year molars. Okay, along those lines, when you've deprogrammed the patient and you're putting that wax wafer in and out, uh, how do you prevent them from, uh, you know, reprogramming? It's a great question. And I actually ask them to open. And if they don't, and they, they're having challenges with that, I'll actually will, in that case, just put a cotton roll between the front teeth, just because it's easy to access and get out just in that brief period of time. Thank you. Good, good question. Uh, when finding RP, why do you only use chin pressure and not also pressure under the mandible similar to bilateral manipulation? I find that some patients fight when I'm using direct chin pressure. It's such a great question and I think I'm going to answer that in two ways. The pressure that we're using on the chin is not pressure. It's actually just a guiding very light force. If you visually were to blow up one of your gloves in the office, like a balloon, and you went to put the amount of pressure I use, it barely indents the glove. It's actually just a control where you can feel the mandible go anterior, sorry, anteriorly, then posteriorly, anteriorly, then posteriorly. We want the patient at that unstrained retral border, but we don't want to strain it past that retral border. As I said in the lecture, it's possible, especially in cases with um, some degenerative joint disease, if you push too hard, you're actually going to create translation in the lower joint space, and that's a problem. So really, we're just using it to control and to feel. If that patient is forcing back at you, you're either pushing too hard or they're not deprogrammed enough. Okay. Uh, somebody wants you to put your conclusion slide back up, if you wouldn't mind there. I will do my best. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All righty. Bear with me one sec here. Yeah. <laughs> How's that? All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, somebody just has the question, examples with edentulous patients. So I guess they're asking the question, uh, say on a, a CD over CD case, uh, what yes. are you doing? Uh, it's a great question, and essentially, I'm using central bearing pin and gothic arch tracing. Um, typically, for a complete denture, I'll have a process base, um, upper and lower, and do the tracing that way. Yeah. Isn't it funny the gothic tracing went away for so long, and now it seems to be back in vogue? Yeah, it, it's fascinating, and interestingly, the short four articles I put into this short lecture came out of a binder that I had from my master's thesis that was over two inches thick. And I've gone through that multiple times and that, that's a struggle in itself. But when you actually go through it, there was some really intelligent thought processes along the way that kind of got swept away. And I think that when you, you look at, as I said, Lucia in that situation in Salenza, they were both using that and it worked very, very well. Essentially getting what we're getting now with the chin point guidance technique. Okay. If there is contact of the tooth in the RP position, does that mean it's not the correct position? I'm gonna actually, can you say that again? It's, if there is contact of the tooth in the RP position, does that mean it's not the correct position? Okay, so I'm assuming what they mean by that is if you have the patient in RP, 
and we're closing and you have an interference, meaning that RCP contact, it's nothing is black and white. Ultimately, the case I showed you is extreme. I mean, that was a huge RCP contact and a huge slide. That slide to further on the, the, the case presentation was both AP as well as sagittally. It created havoc with her, with her musculature. A small little slide, and it may, may be quite normal for a patient. And again, you have to take that one aspect, as I tried to emphasize, and put it with all your other diagnostic findings. Eliminating an interference like that is not necessarily, if a patient is completely asymptomatic and not a problem, and you're not doing any dentistry on the patient, I probably wouldn't touch it. Uh, just a reminder, if you have a question, uh, don't raise your hand. Just type it in the Q&A and we'll get to it here, please. Thank you. Uh, how do you determine treatment position from the mounted RP models? Once again, that's a great question and it's a complicated question because treatment position is not determined just from the models. It's determined from a wide variety of different diagnostic assets that we have, including uh, the condylography, Potentially, we've got MRI, CBCTs, we've got our mounted models, we've got literally all of our diagnostic information that's going into a bucket to allow us to make a, a, an intelligent choice of treatment position. Uh, again, the presenting dentition alone can create a problem with that. Do you mount all your prosthodontic cases every time and do you use triple trays for single crowns? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'll come clean. Very, very rarely, I'll use a triple tray. You got to follow this logic. On a case that is completely asymptomatic, I'm doing a single crown that's bounded by other crowns, for example, a lower five, and usually it's only for gold. Everything else I mount and I do a ton of, I, there's more, more stone, dye stone going around our office than you would believe. It's, <laughs> it's everywhere. Uh, along those lines, uh, have you got into digital at all, scanning, printing models uh, yet? No. And part of the reason is um, I've hesitated at this point. Um, there is so many good things about digital. And in Austria, we're continually updated by the engineers there as to, as to digital. Once the marriage of um, digital technology with the accuracy that I need for full mouth reconstruction is combined with the systems that we use for joint tracings, it's going to be a beautiful thing. The prototypes are there, but they're not quite available yet, hence the reason that I haven't. Okay, a uh, couple of questions on how did you treat the 18 year old patient with the right joint not translating? How did you get it to release? It actually didn't release. I mean, she had degener degenerative joint disease for quite a long time. There was no way to recapture a disc because I'm not sure it was even there. Interestingly with her, she's still a patient and now she's like 30 years old. She's a fantastic girl. I actually treated her with a simple myopathic splint, flat plane, kept adjusting it and adjusting it. And after about six weeks, her symptomatology was gone. And then I equilibrated. Now you got to remember that I equilibrated, equilibrated her in a position where I had to be very, very careful because she did have degenerative joint disease. So it was a step-by-step -step process. Okay. Uh, somebody wants to sell you a complete Stuart articulator. <laughs> Do you need one? Don't want one. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I just, as an aside, and again, I have no skin in that game, but I uh, use a gamma reference articulator for fully, uh, it is fully adjustable when I need it. And I have a series of SAM articulators in my office for uh, when I'm going semi-adjustable. Okay. Uh, and Dr. Rosenwald, uh, why don't you look in Facebook, go to the International Academy of Nathology. You'll find a buyer there, I think, or somebody that you can <laughs> give it to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you sometimes send someone home with a splint to deprogram that if they continue to fight you while finding RP? Absolutely. I actually use Frank Spears technique with an upper deprogrammer. Usually it's uh, made on an Essex. Suck down um, from about the fives forward just with triad acrylic on a micro, I micro etch the Essex and we quickly make that up on an upper model and send them home overnight. Ideally, I like to get them back first thing in the morning before they've gone through much of the day. And I ask them to leave the appliance in uh, as they're coming to the office. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Parlett got these questions. What thickness of articulating paper do you use to check and adjust occlusion? Since I listened to Dr. Parlett's lecture, I, I actually had to think about that one. So I have to <laughs> answer. Um, I'm actually using Artifoil, which I believe is eight microns thick. I also use AccuFilm. Um, I have three different colors. I have black, red, and green in my, off in my practice. And generally I mark, uh, my system is just red is for excursions, black is for centric, and green is for protrusive. But the art, art of foil is exactly what I use most of the time for finishing. Okay. Does head posture and body posture position influence CR? Uh, if I'm gonna use the term reference position in the way that I defined it, um, it's an unstrained retral border and I have the patient sitting directly upright. So it's a standardized procedure. Absolutely, and you can do it yourself. You put your teeth together and tip your head to the right and tip your head to the left, everything changes because the musculature is gonna change the dynamic closure. But in this situation, we're standardizing again, sitting upright, approaching the patient directly from the front. Um, thoughts on tech scan? Ah. I'll answer it kind of the same way that Dr. Parlett answered that question. A T-scan is a fantastic instrument. It's very, very um, accurate. However, again, my critical assessment starts with the joint. It comes down to the teeth. I feel in my hands, but a combination of Brux checkers, Artifoil, and using it, I can accomplish a whole lot. And to get that, I would want to do all of that first and then I might want to check it with a T-scan, but I don't own one and I don't think it's been that big a deal. Okay, uh, do you have any experience with the Cavo Arcus Digma system for joint tracing? No, I know what it is. Okay, more people giving away articulators. Uh, yes, Dr. Rosemold, I did get my instrument sharpener, thank you. Uh, uh, axiography versus condylography. Great question. Axiography was originally the system that we all used that was developed by Dr. Slavicek. Uh, he moved on and now um, the system we're using is electronic condylography by Gamma uh, in Vienna. Um, the, the axiograph, I still have a manual one, which is really um, quite useful. Okay, well, it looks like uh, we've hit the end of our questions here. Uh, anything you want to add that, that those questions stimulated from you? Uh, thoughts? Uh, Timmy, I think that I'm just going to reemphasize that diagnosis is a combination of a large variety of factors. And we only talked about one today. But that said, I think it's something that's been lost in dentistry and it's so important. And if anything comes out of this lecture is just the emphasis for all of us in our daily practices. Okay. Uh, this just came to mind. What are your thoughts about uh, how uh, dental schools have de-emphasized occlusion? <laughs> uh, like I started with my top 10 reasons that they've stopped. I think it's appalling. I mean, I've been in practice long enough to have messed enough things up and to made enough mistakes that I cannot begin to believe that there is no education in that. And when we're all retired in a few years and the TMDs that come home to roost occur, I wish everybody well because there's going to be a lot. Yeah, well, well, thank you, Dr. Tester. And I want to thank all our speakers today uh, from the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics. This was card P day today. Uh, I wore my tie. So nice job, Tim. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Mark Douglas. Thank you, uh, Kim Parlett as well. Thank you all for joining us on this webinar. Uh, for those of you that were a little late onto the webinar, your CE credits will be coming to you from the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. Look for those CE credits in two to three days, uh, business days. They'll be coming as a PDF. It's non-personalized. Just put your name on there. Save that for your records.
AGD members will report your CE credits directly to the AGD and those will show up in your transcripts in two to four weeks. We'd like to thank all our sponsors for the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. This includes Comet USA, Patterson Dental, uh, Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prosthodontics, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, and Seattle King County Dental Society. Uh, I'm Dr. Tim Hess. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to thank our other panelists, Dr. Gary Hayamoto, for monitoring the chat features. I'd like to thank our executive director, Valerie Bartoli, who's been putting in long hours to, to bring these webinars to you. Uh, as I said before, uh, if you missed a, a webinar, uh, these will be available on YouTube. We're gonna keep them up there for a couple of weeks. And then after that, uh, hopefully we'll be able to move them to an on-demand CE library where people can watch and get CE credit. Uh, Reminder, tomorrow, please join us for Dr. Manu Karbash. She is going to be going over systems to implement in your uh, dental office on May 19th when we get back to work and to bring the team into alignment. So uh, she's got some uh, great materials there. Uh, don't forget that Dr. Marcus Trosh is going to be speaking next Tuesday at 10 a.m. He has great information on PPE, aerosols, and it's just a very, very nice presentation. Uh, I guess that's it. I just uh, think uh, I'll say thank you to Dr. Peter Thompson, uh, the president of Card P. We appreciate it. Thanks to all our friends in the Great White North there. And uh, with that, that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tester. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Tester. Doc, Dr. Hayamoto, good job today. <laughs> you know Thank what, you Tim? Gentlemen. I just wish I just wish some people would learn to read. <laughs> well, hold on, we're, we're, still still we're still on. <laughs> uh oh, we'll see. <laughs> Cue 